Welcome and namaste everyone. I'm happy you're here. I hope you had a good week between last week and this and that you're healthy and happy and the knowing that you are love individualized for sure. So we're going to continue with this chapter, which is a, the Baker's Dozen of Suggestions for Going Deeper into Developing Your Spiritual Life. Uh, they're not commandments for sure. They're merely suggestions. What I'm hoping is that as you hear these, or read them if you buy the book, um, which you can do in my website, uh, theinwardway.live, um, then uh, you will see that my emphasis has been upon guiding you to the threshold, but you need to both step over that threshold yourself into a life of spiritual empowerment. So here's number seven. If you really give me what you know I want, why do I even need to ask? Take time now to find out what you truly like and don't like in your life. Returning to home and a joy-filled life starts with us, not with someone else's idea of us. What, come, what kinds of foods, books, movies, spaces, vegetation, wearing apparel, music, and art do you prefer? And there are more things as well, of course. After my divorce, I found that I had for 26 years given up much I had liked or wanted for the sake of others. In a sense, my life had become a blur. I let it happen. I took the next year or so to visit galleries to find out what kind of art I appreciated. I listened to all kinds of music to find my preferences, cooked many recipes to test my palate, all to re-educate myself. And what an eye-opener it was, and what a great time I had doing it. I not only learned about what I did and did not like, but even more important, I learned to respect and enjoy myself in a wide variety of settings and circumstances that I hadn't explored ever before. What a re revelation that was and continues to be, even to this day, because I set the pattern into practice. What do you want your wholesome, supportive environment to contain, to feel and look like? Visualize your ideal environment. Do you like more light or less? More vibrant, vibrant colors or more subtle? Do you prefer to work inside or outside or in an office or home? With people or with things? Test yourself continually about these and other matters important to you. Try out new ideas and discard those no longer useful to a joyful life. Remember, our attitude towards others and things governs the joy we feel. Others and things don't bring us joy. It all starts with us. We are only led to believe that others can make us happy, so we will purchase things or manipulate others to our satisfaction. Not a good idea at all. Contemplate in the depths of your heart. Make your own decisions for what is right for you, and they most always will be. The more you practice, for sure, they most always will be. If for some reason you, your last decision turns out to be inappropriate in a new time frame, it takes just one more decision to change to something else. It's not a matter of being right or wrong anyhow. It's only a matter of knowing in your growing and your ability to be your highest self. All of life is to help us rem remember ourselves as the true image of love we are. It serves to help us grow, so no matter what we do, if we are alert to life's lessons, we grow from them. Mistakes are only that, and they too help us grow. Mistakes are important to us and are not signs of stupidity or lack of worth. Mistakes are like other forms of learning, and growing longs to be celebrated, not feared or punished. Unfortunately, we have come to fear mistakes, thinking they will keep us from getting the approval we'd like. Well, learn, celebrate, forget the curse of fear, and enjoy all of life, including your mistakes. A new email friend of mine recently explained his dilemma. Doubts fed by fear within that caused some confusion about where he needed to live, to stay in Oregon or to follow his inner calling to New Mexico. 
Gordon put it this way. Like many people caught up in the business world, I'm inwardly an artist or artisan whose work in the world has little to do with that inner character. Though I've always chosen to live in green and pleasant geographic areas, I have always been haunted by a desert I carry within me. This is a desert where the creative impulse struggles for subsistence, the world of work. It's always been the case that no more than a trickle of the water of my own inner life is available to flow down into my workaday world. Where a garden should be, there is only a desert. A desert isn't lifeless, mind you, but it doesn't support the delicate and variegated life of the garden. I wasn't meant to live in this inner desert, and there may, that may be why the outer desert evokes such a sense of weakening of alienation. Yet, if my personal life were full and abundant, it's likely I wouldn't. Uh, it, yeah, it's likely I wouldn't care so much about whether the hills around me were brown or green. The whole thing may not be a metaphor at root. There may be really be something going on in the etheric level here wherein I instinctually try to draw the nourishment that should come from the created fulfillment from the surrounding environment instead, from the realm of plants, specifically in this case. The message to go to New Mexico might be the call to break the etheric dependency, which doesn't really fulfill the inner need anyway, and really make an effort to develop creativity so there isn't it, so there so that there isn't this schism between inner and outer. Not, not like I thought it was. It's very, it very well could be that sympathetic influence of the vegetable realm is like a balm that soothes the injuries that may, my eclectic body may have suffered because of circumstances in life. And because of this, I am inordinately drawn to it. Yet any such injury is only a symptom. The problem lies deeper than that, much deeper than that. And this etheric influence can't heal anything beyond its own level. The result? A stalemate that prevents further evolution. I don't let, my, I don't let myself feel my own inner barrenness directly. Instead, I use a natural anesthetic to dull the pain. At the same time, the easy availability of this drug and the places I gravitate toward makes it harder for me to wake up and change. Well, there's my grand theory. But really, I don't feel the need to fathom the intellectual meaning of move to New Mexico. If the impulse becomes strong and clear enough, I'll just do it. The message isn't strong enough for me at this time, however. I, it was really more obvious to a few others who probed into this with me but I can't act on their intuition when my own is not clear. In order to weather the challenges and the strangeness of the change, I gotta have faith, not just reasons. Gordon speaks so profoundly to the challenge of living true to one's calling, but in his inner struggle, he doesn't succumb to his intellect. Hence the eliminate admonition to live by our inner faith and not just outward appearance of rightness. A mistake, a mistake, I suspect, is lived by all too many of us. Just as in all manifestation, what comes to us is what we give ourselves genuine permission to have. Our essence of love knows what is in our hearts. Just be sure that what is in your heart is really what you need and a desire at the deep, deepest levels. As the expression goes, be careful what you ask for, because you really get it, like it or not. That's one of the rules of the universe. My friend Annie jokingly adds, when you ask for something, be very specific. Asking could, could water, asking for water could meet a flood. One thing we know for sure, when we put our inward voice first, everything else falls into place. Pardon me. Number eight. But I don't want to be a pot when I grow up. That sounds weird. It'd be a little less weird in a minute. Take time to find out what you really want your life's work to be. To paraphrase Parker J. Palmer, the spiritual writer and speaker, our vocation is love. Our avocation is expressing love. Are you enthused about what you do day to day? 
day in and day out for a living. The term enthused comes from from entheo, meaning with God or in God. The real question then becomes, do you feel the fullness of enthusiasm in your life's work? Matthew Fox's The, Rec the Recreation of Work speaks most eloquently to this need in all of us. Quote, make no mistake about it, many of us are unduly influenced by su the, su the success syndrome we have been led to understand so well. So much so that many of us put financial success far ahead of the condition of our soul. In sharp contrast, Eric Butterworth in Spiritual Economics puts work in perspective well worth considering when he says so powerfully, when you work in the right consciousness, when your work becomes organically part of your whole self, and when you do your work out of that commitment, no matter what other people do, no matter what the compensation may be, doing it for the health of your own soul, then you open the door by which the affluence of the universe flows forth into your life. What a wonderful admonition. In other words, decide what you want to do and be in your life and the universe will support you in all ways. Many of us have taken a certain path for our life's work by simply falling prey to the easiest way or the nearest opportunity rather than really understanding what kind of work and work environment would make us happy or would enhance our happiness. It sort of feels good and we make a decent living, but, but we're really not happy. We're truer yet, we're not joyful, expressing what we really are. Yes, being joyful is expressing exactly what we really are through all we do. Although I enjoyed much of my 14 years as a college and university CEO, it took me a long time to realize that I didn't need to work eight day weeks in order to exercise what gave me the greatest joy, bringing people together to utilize their life-giving creativity for the greater good of others. Along the way, I also learned of other avenues for creativity within me that were just itching to show their faces show their faces, they did, and my life was much richer for permitting it to happen. Rather than slugging it out in the trenches for years like I did before you learned this lesson, I suggest you use some of the methods that follow to find out your real desire and talents. It might save a lot of time and energy you might use otherwise. Chances are, sometime earlier in life, we listen to someone else say this or that would be good for us or this or that wouldn't be good to us, for us, despite an inner glow we felt about some particular thing we just knew we loved. Or we may have acted from or been influenced by someone else's example. A favorite aunt who just loved nursing or your father, the very successful lawyer. Those are admirable occupations to be sure and they might be right for us if they were indeed our heart's deepest desire not just because somebody else did them. I suspect most of, most of us have been shaped by our parents or some other loved ones, much like the one shapes clay into a pot. Only we are not clay, and we certainly don't need to be a pot. We need only to be ourselves. The real distinction to be made is that the clay, is, is that clay that's to shape us into life's image is a stuff of love. The clay used by others to make us in their image of us is plastic, and we all know the superficiality of plastic as a container of souls calling for us when compared to real clay. The point is, do you really know what it is you truly want to do with your life? A favorite question I like to ask those who are burned out in their current job or who are completely in a fog about what it is they want to do next is, if money were not a consideration, that is, if you could do anything in the world knowing that money you need to live on would follow, what would that one thing be? It's amazing how quickly the answer then comes and how enthusiastically it's expressed. Trust that for you. This answer will be your burning bush that you bring that, that thing that you feel passionate about that which fills your heart with the sacred event of enthusiasm. 
Your answer must be genuinely lived or your soul will wither from lack of expressing its truth. Put another way, the journey of our truth is right for us now and always. The road of others' expectations is, is but a detour to our own eventual truth. For many of us, fear of living our truth basically comes from fearing the lack of resources to make it happen. It is the law of the universe that when the correct spiritual decision is made, when we commit to living our own personal truth, the resources follow. Do what you love, the money will follow by Marcia Sinatar is about that law. It's only because we have been taught to play life safe that we are ignorant of the more powerful laws of the universe, thereby subjecting ourselves to an intellectual and emotional space that stifles our spirit and damages our soul and keeps both our hearts and pockets empty. If you're unwilling to work through some of those issues in this regard, I commend Barbara Scherer's Wishcraft, How to Get What You Really Want. After using the book, I think the, the subtitle should be How to Express What You Really Are. In any event, providing you take this quest seriously, Cher will take you very methodically through a series of steps that are sure to result in unmistakable clarity about what direction you must take. The thought of change may be frightening at first, but the thought of staying mired in something that is displeasing or unfulfilling is even more overpowering. So take the time to locate your heart's truest desire and leap. Think of it this way. If you leap, either love's ways will catch you or you'll be taught to fly. Either is a much better alternative than staying mired in the quagmire of illusional safety and our own fears. In my own circumstance, I left the field of higher education after 30 years of teaching and administration. Life was certainly comfortable and I enjoyed much of the labor due to my nature. Even so, there came a time when I simply knew I must move on. The calling to something new was that strong, even though I had no idea what that something new was to be, just that it was on the way. Fear caused me to delay my decision somewhat, but when an opportunity came for me to exercise an early retirement option, I did so and moved to Santa Fe without portfolio or job in hand or even one in mind. A full three years later, I came to see the grand plan when I received a phone call from the same Pecos Monastery asking if I would be their first part-time lay director of public relations and fundraising. My heart was filled with the joy of anticipation and the peace of knowing that life's ways are in charge of all aspects of my life. In the shower one morning following the acceptance of this appointment, I dared ask God if I had spent 30 years in higher education as preparation for working in a monastery. The answer came as a resounding bout of laughter, suddenly knowing the tooth of the silent affirmation within. You see, our inner voice was a wonderful, has a wonderful sense of humor and a perfect sense of timing. And each day is a new joy to behold and be grateful for. Another helpful source in this regard is Julia Cameron's The, Artist, the Artist's Way. But a title you may think this book deals only with those who think they are or might want to be an artist. But Cameron's work goes much deeper than that. There is some kind of an artist in each of us, just waiting to be expressed. The, art, the artist in our innermost self looking for just the right means to say, here I am, here's what I'm really like. Art is about that, in whatever form. Look at the external expression of the artist or individual. Learn to read such expressions as the metaphors they are, and you will find the heart of uh, the artist within prominently displayed and you will paint yourself as an artist with joy. Many of us strive to know more about ourselves by using such things as the Meyer-Briggs inventory, the Enneagram, astrological, astrological charts, or Chinese mythology. Such aids can be helpful for sure, providing we don't identify with or make gods out of what we find out about ourselves. Although we may display characteristics of an INFP or the on the Myers-Briggs inventory, 
We are not an INFP or anything it portrays. Very simply, and hear this deeply, we are love. We are love portrayed through these characteristics. We are love portrayed through being an artist, through being a lawyer, through being a housewife, through being a husband. The same is true when I proclaim myself to be, let us say, an athlete. I am not an athlete. I merely express my love through the vehicle of athletics. Unfortunately, when we identify with a characteristic, we tend to point our world with it, paint our world with it. Herein lies the danger of their use, so use these tools wisely. Perhaps the most startling understanding to come out of all this is that our primary responsibility in life is to be an unabashed expression of the art of loving. Our job is to remember what love is and what it is not, and to clean out the latter so we can live the former. In simpler terms, we are artists of loving. Our vision is one of loving. Our medium is loving. Our tools are loving. The ultimate product is loving. The pathway is loving. We can manifest love through whatever we do as human beings, for we are beings of love, and loving is expressed through all we do as our truest life's work. That's our only real purpose, actually. I said it differently earlier. Our purpose is to be fully aware and to live like one who is. These are one and the same expression. No matter which phrase we use to describe our purpose, our lives become nothing but the authentic expression of the loving way. Number nine, where is the party? Closely akin to the last item, life is important, so for goodness sake, celebrate it. Make every event a celebration of what you are. One, one Sunday, a church service I attended began with the inspirational song, The Rose. Here's the, here are the lyrics. Some say love, it is a river that, downs, that drowns a tender reed. Some say love, it is a razor that leaves your soul to bleed. Some say love, it is a hunger, an endless aching need. I say love, it is a flower, and you, it's only seed. It's a heart afraid of breaking that never learns to dance. It's a dream afraid of waking that never takes a chance. It's the one who won't be taken, who cannot seem to give, and the soul afraid of dying that never learns to live. When the night has been too lonely and the road has been too long, and you think that love is only for the lucky and the strong, just remember in the winter far beneath the better snow lies the seed that within that with the same sun's love and the spring becomes the rose. I say love, it is a flower, and you its only seed. If we could only fathom the fullness of this understanding and celebrate all we are, through all we do, life would indeed blossom into a bouquet of love. Celebrate your relationships for it is in the relationship that we find ourselves. For example, I find it healthy to begin every day, every working day, waking day in celebration of relationship, all my relationships, starting with the relationship with my inner self. On the date of our wedding vows and each month, for example, my former spouse and I, at the very least, exchanged cards, making special note of our relationship. This way, we got to celebrate the relationship we treasured more than once a year. We did it every day. When we, when we took time to celebrate each day as we awoke, every day then became special. When any of us takes time to celebrate, as we retire at night with expressions of gratitude, the gifts of relationships witnesses throughout the day, this single act acknowledges love's continual presence in our lives and our appreciation for it. I appreciate you in my life goes a long way with life itself too, after all. Not because life needs that as a sign of appreciation, but because it releases the goodness in our hearts to acknowledge the, the truth of relationship. Loving is at its center. And living in love provides the peace and joy for which we all strive. It is that acknowledgement which gladdens our heart. For doing so, we are engaging in the remembering with love which life has as our ultimate purpose. 
The same is true in our relationships with others and things. Find a simple but overt way to celebrate your relationship with your co-workers, your friends, your spouse, your partner, your dog or cat, yes, even your home, your car, your favorite tree or music. Everything is at one with us, so celebrate everything, absolutely everything. Make celebration a sacred ritual. All it takes is appreciation expressed as a joyful heart. Matthew Fox said it in this way during a presentation made in Santa Fe. Praise is the noise joy makes. We are the joy of divinity. Everything else is but a detail. Celebrate even with your touches, your tears, your laughter, your hugs. Holding back is a sign of indifference and will eventually, or fear and will eventually turn your head to stone, heart to stone. When we place ourselves in difference or to or with something or someone, we are not in love or somewhere else or in difference. Necessary human rituals long to be expressed and need to be honored. You honor your highest self when you express what you are in whatever form. For you are being authentically you when you do. You are not pretending you are something you are not. So your dignity is rendered sacred and whole once again. I have often discussed the sadness I feel when thinking of the widow elderly who have no one with whom to express love through touching. They eventually suffer from touch deprivation and their soul begins to wither on the vine. Perhaps this is the reason why so many people have pets that they can touch and stroke. Touching is a beautiful expression of trust and relationship and can be conveyed in a sensitive manner without any thought of sexual connotation. Touch with honorable intentions and honorably it will be received. Freely shedding tears is another way of celebrating what we are in the moment. I have found that tears founded in separation are sometimes stinging and salty, while tears found in unity, in love, are soft, warm, oily, and of a healing quality. It is sad that society has taught us not to cry publicly. Particularly men have been taught not to cry, that to cry is not manly, whatever manly is. Even if, fears, even if tears begin only as an expression of sentiment, they eventually lead us to deeper levels of being. That is, that is the nature of crying and a major, and a major purpose of its per existence. I attended a weekend spiritual retreat for men several years ago, which brought us very close to one another in a short period of time. When it came time to say goodbye, a big, strong ex-football player, about 35 years old, while hugging me with tears in his eyes, said, I want to thank you for being an example for me. I figured if someone your age could cry, then so could I. I haven't cried since I was a baby. I can't tell you what a relief it is to know. It's okay for me to express my feelings even this way. Let us not make the same mistake with those we raise. It's a sign of strength to express yourself genuinely, all parts of yourself. To stuff feelings is a set the stage for major dis-ease with life and with ourselves. Expressing ourselves freely, authentically, is a cure for much that ills us. Our feelings are a teacher for moving us forward. A brief short story about hugging that will make its own point. Let us call her Mary. Mary has been rendered hug shy by a mother who gave birth to her at age 16, blaming Mary for her circumstances, believe it or not. Mary grew to understand that she was not loved and so grew in her distrust of others in the matters of love. Now in her 30s, Mary attended a four-day retreat with Amici, an East Indian religious woman. One, one night, Amici went to hug Mary Mary responded in her characteristically tentative fashion, like some kind of invisible shield separated her from Amaji, offering only part of her guarded heart and only one arm. Amaji telepathically responded with, no, no, like this, putting Mary's arms around her, squeezing firmly, tenderly, lovingly. Mary's heart opened wide, feeling and giving, perhaps for the first time, 
unbridled love and complete trust. Mary hugs much differently now, for she has learned by divine grace that, just like eye contact or a gentle touch, a hug is an, unmistake, an unmistakable imprint of love that seals a relationship with trust. And it gives love twice, once to the other, and second to ourselves. Yes, love thy neighbor as thyself. Do unto others as you would have, have done unto you. Hug, hug, hug. On a different level, my father used to tell me to find a way to enjoy, to be with joy in everything I do whether it was mowing the lawn, picking berries, or painting the house. Dad began teaching me by mowing the lawn with me when I was a child, showing how patterns in the grass could be fun to create. He showed me the joy of painting a French window by sharing the tricks of his trade and by encouraging me to sing or whistle while I worked. Of course, what my father was really showing me was the joy of creation, how to find my different, my deepest being and to express all I am through all I do. That is the joy I was to find. It took me a long time, but I finally got it. A great teacher was my father to the point where one of my sons often tells me that I don't know how to be bored. I think that son now knows better too. What a blessing that is. The point is when you are able to find joy, your divine self in all you do, and express what you are through all you do, everything can then be celebrated as a sacred event. Whatever you do will be your meditation, a gift to life, your continual life's prayer. It is our life's work, for goodness sakes. When you can reach this point, you will find yourself in relationships with those who also are celebrations of their own very existence. Your surroundings will appear as celebrations and your life's work likewise will be, will be a celebration. We even, we've even finally come to treat the very extensive environment which supports us in this life as a perpetual celebration rather than demeaning the dignity by ruining its rivers, polluting its air, and clear-cutting its trees. When in doubt, celebrate. Number 10. Why are you killing God with that cigarette? Our body is our temple. It is the means for manifesting our highest spiritual self. If you believe as I do, we are created as one. We are one with all beings. In that sense, I am in all beings and all are in me. Because this is so, it is incumbent upon me to treat my temple of all life with reverence, thus also requiring myself to treat all other temples of being likewise. From this knowledge flows the ways in which I feed my body, exercise it, cleanse it, shelter it, rest it, and otherwise nourish it. Wellness requires, and by the way, I do fail in some of these from time to time, wellness requires such patience in searching out the very best ways to live holistically in order to reach and maintain my fullest integrity, mentally, physically, and spiritually. Although we as humans are all endowed with the same basic needs for food, clothing, shelter, and a need to express love, given our individual life histories, each of us is, is unique in the ways we must relate with these ingredients. So while certain foods, exercises, and other treatments may be good for all of us, within such categories we must find those which resonate most clearly with our innermost needs. Simplicity is the key. Treat the exotic and complex as the enemy. Simple food, simple travel arrangements, simplicity in relationships, and an exercise is one day and all creates peace, all create peace as life flows. Living simply permits an abundance of adventure to flow unimpaired by the complexities we so often indulge ourselves with, mostly as complexities we have created in our mind as false information, simply illusions. As we come to find and live our individual best in the moment and request that others respect our choices and support us in their fulfillment, we too must respect the divine domain of the other, trusting that they too are making similar choices for their own highest good. However, sometimes we need to be reminded 
of offenses to ourselves or another, lest we once again forget our primary commitment to the highest good, individually and collectively. I'll never forget the following incident. One day, while walking back to my hotel in Washington, D.C., following a meeting several blocks away, I find myself alongside a young woman smoking a cigarette. I looked at her, smiled, and said something intelligent like, Hi, how are you? <laughs> she acknowledged my greeting, and we strolled side by side a few steps further when, totally without warning, out of my mouth came the following. Do you believe that God resides in you? Startled. For a moment, she fumbled, well, uh, yes, I do. Well, if you do, I responded, why are you killing God with that cigarette? Oh, my God, she gasped, disgustingly casting her cigarette aside. I momentarily turned to my colleague to tell him what had happened, returning my attention immediately to the smoker to see if she was she was okay, only to find her nowhere in sight. In the street scene, only sparsely populated, she had totally disappeared. I hope her cigarette smoking habit vanished as easily. Permit one more story to complete the point about living more simply. Recently, I was deeply moved by some of Selgado's black and white photographs at Selgado, S-A-L-G-A-D-O. By dialoguing with, a, with that deep feeling, I learned that I was connected with the very place from which I photograph, and in the medium black and white soul work that expresses what I am best. In the ensuing conversation, I was directed to simplify my, my artistic life by selling all my camera equipment, beginning again with just one camera I thought best for that work and letting nothing deter me from that goal. I was told that I had been scattering my creative energy by photographing a fairly wide variety of substances and images with a broad range of equipment. To the point all this was deterring me from expressing my deepest self in a manner best suited for the process of my spiritual expression. I asked and I got the answer. Now what was I to do with it? If I am learning nothing else, it is that when I am guided from within, I must follow that guidance or it is sure to dry up as my authentic guide. And so I did follow it. Within a few days, I learned from a camera swap uh, and sale arranged to sell all my equipment as instructed as affirmation to be sure it was easy and simple to accomplish a sure sign of love's hand in my works. On the day of the sale, before the doors even officially opened, I sold a few sold a few dealers some pieces I thought I surely would get stuck with. Another affirmation. As the day ended, seemingly effortlessly with less than with lots of thanks for each inquiry and, and sale, all but a few fragments sold for over seven thousand dollars. Talk about affirmation. I told the salesperson next to me about my adventure, and he volunteered to steer people my way with the remaining few pieces of equipment, and he did. He had another affirmation. The arrangements made to photograph black and white soul work, as it were, went swimmingly, again affirming the correctness of simplifying a significant part of my life and placing me in the place where I could best express my calling in connection with the soul at large doing what it was best from our own highest soul, our highest good, is the only authentic road to travel. I am what I am what I am. Understand this down to the very marrow in your bones. It is none of your business what anyone else thinks about you. Simple to say, but sometimes difficult to live. Nearly all we've taught by the masterminds of the marketing and advertising world, it is the only thing that matters is what others think about us. Wear this, drive that, use this, take that, go here, live this way, behave in this fashion. The implication is that if you don't, others who do will think less of you. Where does it end? Unfortunately, if we are not very careful, it all ends in the expectations of those 
who controls such thinking. How can we fight this concept of living what is so dominant that has been so dominant in our Western culture? It is an insidious game, and the only way to win it is not to play it. Don't buy in. The same is true in all the games of life, like the game of manipulation or drug use, for example. The only way to win the game is to not play the game. Don't take the bait to compete. Live your own standards, which have been discarded in communion with your loving heart. I'm sorry, which have been discerned in communion with your loving heart. <laughs> that didn't make it any sense to me at all the other way. As the expression goes, you know in your heart what's the thing to do. Do that and none else. Like anything of worth, this will take some practice, but you can and must follow your own heart if you are to live authentically. If you are going to be genuinely you and not someone else's expectations of you, or what you falsely think are someone else's expectations for you, the real long-term benefit of living to your heart is that the mind comes to store and use truth as your new way of being. Then all of life begins to align with your truth. If we go throughout life acting only to please others, to seek their approval, we end up selling our soul to the devils, the devils of self-deceit and fear of lack, of affirmation or approval, all nothing but limitations of the real devil, fear. I'm sorry, the real imitations of the real devil, fear. Are we willing to pay the price? I'm not. When we make ourselves, when we, when we make decisions or act on the job or in a relationship out of our comfort for what everyone else thinks, rather than assessing whether those decisions and actions are true to our heart, we will have deceived ourselves in major proportions and will deceive those others as well. Big time. Really big time. Okay, I'm just summing through here, wanting to make sure that I'm, I'm covering it all. Yes. This is a story I'm going to close with. With eyes to see is about sacredness, the sacredness of dignity of all beings. When life is created and given out of an attitude of loving spirit, this ultimate truth is well illustrated by a story credited to author and poet Stephen Levine. It goes something like this. Long ago, some monks and their abbot were living in a monastery perched high on a hill overlooking a village in the Far East. The immediate, the immediate area was being ravaged by samurai warriors, and the monks became justifiably worried that they would be a, a possible next target. The abbot worked hard at calming them down and told the monks he would go to the village and deal with the samurais himself, head on. The others, of course, begged him not to go, but he reassured them that everything would be fine, saying that he would be certain to return safely by nightfall. The abbot proceeded on foot into the village, where he was soon greeted by a band of samurais on horseback. The lead samurai, brandishing his sword above him, said, You fool! Do you not understand that with this sword I have the power to destroy you? The abbot responded calmly, And do you not understand that I have the power to let you? The being goes on to say that what the abbot implies with that response is, And I shall go into eternity loving you just the same. It is what it is. Further concludes Levine, the leader told his fellow samurais to leave the abbot and his monks alone, and years later, after their battles ended, the former samurai warrior himself went to study with the abbot, proclaiming, proclaiming him to be the greatest warrior he had ever known. <coughs> Amen, I say to that. For me, the lesson of this story is that our matter with anyone goes that no matter what anyone does to me, whether they try to destroy me physically or by character assassination, the only thing that really matters is how I live my life, how I respond to the actions of others. This does not mean that I do not defend my rights, that when my rights are violated, 
I and I alone must determine how I will respond out of fear or out of love. I and I alone control my response to life circumstances and situations. If I give that power away, I give with it my obligation to be my authentic self. When I, when I maintain my authenticity, my sole purpose then becomes one of always loving, of acting from my deepest core of being, of being the example of loving I was created to be, out of understanding and compassion for my brothers and sisters. If we can use the lessons of this story as our guide, our light, we can then come to see ourselves as one with all of life, and therefore to treat all of it with loving respect and the highest form of dignity. Such is the sacredness of dignity, dignity, no matter what the form of life. Such is spiritual love, expressed as our new way of seeing and being. And that is the last page of With Eyes to See by yours truly, Jim Young. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have enjoyed reading it to you and bringing it to you. Uh, it, it's been a labor of love to be sure, uh, without question. Uh, it's a... Uh, one of those things that you wake up one day and you feel, oh, I'm to do what? Uh, and then you do it. You know, I like to end these things with the little posts I've seen from week to week. And so I'll close with this one. You can't start the next chapter of your life if you keep rereading the last one. Oh, what an, an empowering statement. You can't start the next chapter of your life if you keep rereading the last one. And I would add, because rereading keeps you in the, in the path of diversion, not living your life authentically. Okay, folks, so that's the end of this book. I don't know which book will be my next one. But uh, there it is, and I hope that it, uh, between now and then, you stay healthy and wise. I know you will. I love you. Namaste.